Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We glorify your name because of the love and the interest you have given us to study your word. And we know it's the study of your word that makes us strong, that makes us stable, that makes us steadfast in the things of the Lord. We pray tonight that your word once again will strengthen us in the inner man in Jesus' name. That will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that Lord, as we go out there into the world, will live the victorious life, the conquering life by the uh, solid word of God in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that when we are strong, by the preaching of the word, hearing of the word, reception of the word, and by digesting that word, and by having that word mixed with us in and through and through, it's only then we'll be able to face all the battles of life victoriously. Therefore, Lord, we pray that today, this word will be strength for us. Yeah will be spiritual food for us will enlighten us will be light in our pathway and will be victorious every time in our family in our personal lives everywhere we go in jesus name thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray we're back to the study of the word of god tonight and as we're back to the study of the word we want to see once again what it is the lord has for us in second peter chapter one i'm reading from verse 12 it says wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though ye know them and be established in the present truth yea i think it meet as long as i am in this tabernacle that means in this body of clay to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly i must put up this my tabernacle even as our lord jesus christ has showed me moreover i will endeavor that ye may be able after my disease after my departure after my death to have these things always in remembrance for because we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from god the father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount here tonight as we look at this watch of god and the apostle peter as a good pastor as a good leader as a person that wanted his ministry to outlive him that is he had started the ministry it wasn't just wanting a temporary success a present day success and then after he died everything will be over he wanted the stability of that ministry and he wanted after these people had received the word of god that when he had gone out of this world and it was no more available to minister to them the watch he had taught them will remain in their hearts actually from the passage i read to you you will know that this peter he knew his approaching death he knew about that because the lord had revealed that to him he said in verse uh, in verse 13 he says yes yeah i think it's suitable i i think it fit i think it necessary i think it meet as long as i am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly very soon i must put up this my tabernacle even as our lord jesus christ has showed me and actually he talked about that he spoke about that as his departure as his exodus and when you think about exodus he using this exodus the departure of the disease of the dead as an illustration or illustrated by the children of israel how they came out of egypt and he talked about his going out of the world similar to the time when the children of israel left egypt and he went to the promised land peter saw his approaching death not as a bitter event but a better experience a departure from the world of bondage to god's eternal glory eternal promised land with that approaching death approaching departure he saw no need to change his message of ministry 
but he wanted only to reaffirm the message and to remind the believers of the necessity of steadfastness in the timeless truth what he preached before he was still wanting to emphasize that same truth i said it before i'm saying it today i want to keep on saying it until i die he said and he said it will be very soon when the lord himself will call him home and when he goes home he wants to be very sure that these people that are at the word of god and i believe the word of god and were establishing the present truth they remain in that word that's the reason he was writing to them what a wise leader what a wise minister what a wise pastor he was his concern was that the truth the message the doctrines and the practices of the church he had given unto them will outlive him that he is that the truth will remain in its fullness in its completeness and its entirety in the church after his departure and what he had in mind is the same thing that paul the apostle had in mind that's why he was telling timothy when he wrote to timothy in second timothy chapter 2 verse 2 when he said and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same don't change it the same don't adulterate it the same don't modify it the same don't turn it over the same don't cut out of it the same don't add to it that same thing you will commit unto faithful men find faithful men they don't find unstable unfaithful wishy washy men or women who do not have a heart for the authority of the word of god who are jellyfish and they do not have backbone and they do not have conviction find out people who are committed people who are consecrated and people who love this truth of the word of god more than their very lives and the same thing i'm giving you you will commit unto them who shall be able to teach others also paul the apostle also wanted that truth he had preached to outlive him that the people that believed it at that time will keep on believing it and keep on believing it and keep on believing it what a wonderful thing as we consider that that today in our church here the truth we have believed and the truth we have held and the truth we have practiced we want to keep on believing it while your leader your pastor the founder is still alive while the general superintendent is still alive while the one that the lord used to establish in this present truth while he's still alive you want to make sure that you accept the word you are holding on to the word you are establishing the word and then he'll be sure if you can hold on to it while he's still alive if you can stand by it while he's still alive if you can consecrate and even endure persecution on the basis of the word of god while he's still alive then he will be sure that after he has gone you'll be standing on it because that is the beauty and the glory and the reward of ministry that will teach you accept you live by it and you continue in it that's why he took time to remind the christians of the truth they had already believed after his death they were not to be searching for new doctrines and strange revelations they were to keep on believing and practicing the same truth god's revealed truth in scripture in which they were already established look at verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though ye knew them and be established in the present truth he said yes i know you know them and i even know that you are establishing them but all the same i want to keep on emphasizing it emphasizing it so as to keep on reminding you do you see in this short passage i read to you how he used the word remembrance 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 three times look at verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance look at verse 13 yes i think it's suitable meat and feed as long as i'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance and then as it goes on he uses that word again he wanted them to remember verse 15 moreover i will endeavor that ye may be able after my disease to have these things always in remembrance and that's the thing we need to do that's the reason we're emphasizing it over 
and over and over. And there are people that think we know that already. We have even taught other people. And we establish in this truth we are trying to emphasize. Go to another scene. No, there's no other scene. We keep on emphasizing, emphasizing, and repeating until we breathe our last breath. And then we can be sure that you'll continue. We're going to divide the study into three parts. Number one, remembrance of important, timeless truths. The remembrance of important, timeless truth. Number two, reaffirmation of an incomparable testimony. The reaffirmation of an incomparable testimony. Number three, the recollection of the instructive transfiguration. The recollection of the instructive transfiguration. I come back to number one. Remembrance of important timeless truth. In Second Peter chapter 1 verse 12, wherefore I Peter, wherefore I the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherefore I appointed a servant of Christ and an apostle of Jesus Christ, wherefore I that God has used, raised up to teach you these things, I will not be negligent, I will not be careless to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though ye know them and be established in the present truth, yea, I think it meet. I think this is the right thing to do. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put up this tabernacle. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ assured me, moreover, he said in verse 15, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my disease, after my death, after my departure from this earth to have these things always in remembrance. This has been the concern of every minister of the gospel, of every preacher, of every Christian leader that God has raised up that we will not sow to the wind, that we will not sow on the passage, on the hard ground, but that the word will sow, the seed will sow, will grow up and will bear fruit and will remain and will still be bearing fruit even after many, many years. And not just in the New Testament only, it was a concern of Moses as well. It was a concern of Joshua. It was a concern of many people that had been used of the Lord in years, days gone by. In Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, I'm reading verses 39 and 40. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it, and remember, you see that word, and remember, and remember all the commandments of the Lord. Remember, remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, that ye seek not after your own heart, or your own eyes, after ye, after which ye used to go a warning that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Never forget, you are born again. He wants you to be holy unto the Lord. And then you keep on, you keep on in the Lord all the time. The truths of the gospel are important and timeless. The truths of the gospel important and timeless it's not something we believe today and then after some time we don't want to believe it anymore it's not something we practice today and then after some time we don't want to practice it anymore that truth is important is essential is timeless is eternal because it is the word of god that's why look at this in deuteronomy chapter 12 deuteronomy chapter 12 Reading there in verse 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not arch thereto, nor diminish from it all that you have learned, the truth of the gospel. You will not add anything to it, you will not diminish, subtract anything from it. In Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, Proverbs 30, 5 and 6. Here it says, every word of God is pure. 
he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar that's why he tells us in revelation chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 verse 18 for i testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things god shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away if any man shall take away if any man shall take away any man no matter how exalted how popular how powerful how rich how educated no matter his position in society if anyone will come into the church after the lord has helped us all these years to build on this solid foundation of the unchanging eternal timeless word of god the gospel of the lord jesus christ if any man anyone anywhere either some of the old timers or some of the newcomers and they begin to twist and distort and change and remove if anyone shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take away his path out of the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are reaching in this book and that, that's the reason why the word of god the gospel will have been taught about jesus christ his virgin birth his sinless life his betrayal his death on the cross of calvary for our salvation and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven all that we still believe and you keep on believing that's why the word of god that the lord has taught you man's depravity all have sinned and come short of the glory of god and that by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified only by the grace of god by the shedding of the blood of jesus christ are we saved and cleansed and converted and the necessity of repentance that all these times of ignorance god winked at but now he commanded all men everywhere to repent and the watch of restitution when you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has ought against you you leave your gift there at the altar and you go back to your brother and you reconcile with your brother and then you come back and you offer that gift and you remember Zacchaeus, lord half of my goods i give to the poor and if i'm taking anything by wrong accusation by false accusation from any man i restore it fourfold abimelech the woman you have in your house is another man's wife restore him his wife and he shall pray for thee because he is a prophet if thou restore not his wife unto him behold thou shalt die and all thy house the word of restitution repentance restitution and being born again the watch of the new birth the gospel that the lord has given us except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god we still remain on the authority of that world and there's nobody coming here and trying to chip something away out of it take something out of it the word of sanctification this is the will of god even your sanctification jesus christ that he might sanctify the people he died the outside the gate let us go therefore outside the gate bearing his reproach sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth after we are sanctified it tells us we can be baptized in the holy ghost for ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me and then in jerusalem and in judea and in samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth is telling us you don't take away you don't add unto it the word of evangelism the ministry of every believer that tells us go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature don't go to the world make money don't go to work because of business don't go all around and change everything and then all you are looking for now you're looking for deliverance you're looking for success you're looking for money you're looking for this and that go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned the word of faith in god 
faith in God. Because without faith, no man shall be able, you will not be able to please God. He that cometh to God, he must believe that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The word of God that says, you will fear God only, you will not fear man, you will not fear witches, you will not fear wizards, because he says, I say unto you, and I show you whom you will fear. Fear him who is able to kill, and then be able to destroy the soul in hell. And he says, we should not fear any man, and not five sparrows so for a farthing, and one of them will not fall to the ground, except by the knowledge of your father. Ye are of more value than many sparrows, therefore fear them not. I send you among us sheep, among the wolves, but you're not going to fear them, because even the ears on your head, they are all numbered. It's telling us there's protection for us, there's victory for us, victory over sin, victory over sickness, and victory over Satan. It's telling us, don't change that thing. Don't change that thing. And now you are teaching. And now you are telling us, fear witches and fear wizards and fear evil spirits. And then you bring superstition in. Don't add your tribal superstition on the word of God. Stand on this unchanging word of God. And stand on this word that tells us at the beginning he made them male singular and female singular. For this cause shall a man singular leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife singular. And they will be one flesh and they are joined together what God has joined together let no man put asunder no divorce and remarriage you stand on that word and whatever is happening whatever wind may be blowing whatever other churches may be saying it says I say unto you that if any man shall add unto any of these things God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away out of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the holy book that is written. Have you been baptized in water because it talks about water baptism? And anytime there is the Lord's Supper, you are running away from church. Anytime they announce there is going to be Lord's Supper, you believe every other thing except that. Because your life is not right, your life is not pure, your life is not straightforward. And if you are missing the Lord's Supper every time, every time, have you not taken that away? You never get yourself spiritually qualified so that you can take the Lord's Supper. And yet he said, this take, this is my body that is broken for you. And then take, he gave them the cup, drink. This is my blood which is shed for the remission of sin. As often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Why are you taking that away from the watch of God? And it says, you must not add and you must not take away. Do you still believe that the rapture is going to happen? Because the dead shall rise. And we which are alive, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And after the rapture, there's that seven year tribulation. And then there's the resurrection of the dead. And then there's a the millennial reign. When Christ will reign a thousand years, then there's a the great white throne judgment. And then when everything is finalized, there's eternal heaven, eternal joy, eternal bliss, eternal blessedness for the children of God. And then there is eternal hell for the people that die unrepentant, impenitent in their sins. It's telling you, here is the word of God. And you must not take anything away out of it. That's why Peter, he was concerned. He said, yes. As long as I am in this tabernacle, I think it's suitable and meet to put you always in remembrance of these things, even though you know them and you are pres and you are established in the present truth. That's the reason we are now studying the word of God and we're saying the same thing that we have learned. All these years, we remain with them. We abide with them. And there is no small part of the word of God. And there is no big chunk of the word of God. Every part of the word of God is important. Every judge and every title. So you will not say, the one I'm taking away is only the small part. No small part. You believe everything, you stand on everything. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this cause have I said unto you, Timothy, who is my beloved son, who is my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Can we say that today? Can I pick any of these people here who have been with us, who have been with me all these many years, and send them to Corinth, send them to Macedonia, Send them where there is a need. 
and write to those people with confidence i'm busy at this time i cannot come to you but this one i'm sending beloved son faithful son he will act he will preach he will pray he will teach he will behave as a real representative beloved son even while we're still here together and we see eyeball to eyeball face to face there are those in my presence who will twist it change it and go their own way submission to authority is out of their christian lives obedience to christian leadership is out of their christian life but paul the apostle said i'm sending timothy also to you whether i am there or i am not there he will do exactly as he knows i a spiritual father as i want him to do what a challenge and i'm challenging i'm, I'm talking about every member not just the workers not just the leaders not just the region of overseers or state of overseers or the coordinators or whatever name i'm talking about everybody in the church because if you are not a faithful follower you will never be a faithful representative if while now you are not a worker if right now you are not maybe you are not a preacher if right now all you are doing maybe it's just singing in the choir maybe it's just being an usher maybe it's just doing any other thing and you forget that as you are doing that thing there is a pastor that makes it possible for you to sing if there is no pastor there is no congregation no preaching your no singing will be will be in vain you'll be hanging the singing in the air the singing will not be necessary there is a pastor that creates the platform for you to do what you're doing and therefore you want to be submissive you want to be subjected to the word of god you don't want to be heady and stubborn and rebellious and disobedient and incorrigible but you know timothy timothy was on this watch of god and paul the apostle knew him and he said show sure, this young man because of this because of the way i'm sure of him i've tested him and i've proved him and i see this is a dependable person under his leadership oh yes there were other people timothy did not go to take instruction from those other people he took instruction from his spiritual father are you an orphan in the church you have a father spiritual father and you act like an orphan no father no instruction no dedication faithfulness to the watch of god what's happening to you how will you ever be a faithful representative how will we have confidence in you to send you to macedonia Achaia, or to corinth or to ephesus or to all these places when we're not sure of you while we're here we don't know what you're doing and we don't we don't see we don't accept what you're doing it's by force we're trying to manage and sometimes we're pet you and sometimes we're trying to we cannot even say no to you we cannot say don't do this don't do that while we cannot say that here now how can we ever promote you and get you into higher ministry but you know paul the apostle you know even though timothy had his weaknesses because he was a timid person he was a fearful person he was not a strong personality bold and courageous but he made up for the timidity and the fear he made up with the faithfulness and the loyalty and the submission and the subjection to authority and paul the apostle said although this is a timid fellow and he doesn't have all the courage and all the power and all the iron constitution all the same i'm going to trust him for this cause have i sent unto you unto you corinthians timotheus who is my beloved son and faithful in the lord who shall bring you into remembrance of all my ways which be in christ as i teach everywhere in every church in first timothy chapter four first timothy chapter four i'm reading to you in verse six here is telling us now that it is the same thing that we keep on teaching and we keep on commanding and we don't change we don't modify we don't adjust in first timothy chapter four verse six if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things thou shalt be a good minister of jesus christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good dream whereunto thou hast attained put the brethren in remembrance coordinator when we put outline in your hand on sunday 
I will say stick to that outline. Stay with that outline. Put them in remembrance. Do you push the outline aside and teach whatever you want to teach? You had a dream recently. You had a vision recently. You had an anointing recently. So you don't go by the outline. How unfaithful, disloyal you are. But it says, Timothy, I put it in your hand. That same thing I put in your hand. Go and teach other people and tell them the words of life. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, verses one and two this second epistle beloved i now write unto you in both which i stir you i stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance i stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance then it says that he might be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the lord and savior it said we are apostles and therefore we have commandment and we command you apostles apostles command leaders command overseers command pastors command and it says we put this in your hand as the apostles of the lord jesus christ and we are asking you and telling you all these things were received by the commandment of the apostles you will carry out you know they did it in the early church turn to acts chapter 16. acts chapter 16 verse 4 and as they went through the cities they delivered to them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at jerusalem the headquarters church apostles and elders which were at jerusalem all the commandments they wrote down and they gave all the branch churches they didn't count them as suggestion they didn't count them as ideas but it says the decrees which the others were to keep and while we're here together and you have a leader that is saying this is the word of god one man one wife and before you get married to that one wife you pray you know the will of god and as you know the will of god this is how to get it done do we obey as we say this is how to live the christian life and this is how to conduct yourself in the service of the lord this is this and this is this do we obey it's not the church divided into sections and the sectional leaders are more powerful on that section than the pastor whom the lord has appointed over the church and once we're carrying out the instruction of the sectional leader even if we don't carry out the instruction of the pastor of the leader the overall leader and founder in the church that doesn't matter once we're carrying out the limited local instruction of the sectional leader that's enough you see what we're saying they delivered unto them not the instructions of the sectional leaders they delivered unto them the decrees for to keep that is which were ordained of the prophets the elders the apostles which were jerusalem that's what the lord is telling us that we still need to do today so that we'll be pleasing the lord and so that even if the apostle is gone even if the pastor is gone we'll still be able to keep to that word these truths that we're learning they're important and timeless and though we know them and we're established in them at present we are prone to forgetting amidst the cares of the world and the trials of life and the temptations of this world even true christians can forget to be steadfast and to hold on to the practice of sound doctrine the apostle did not doubt that these believers were confirmed and established in the truth yet there was a need to constantly put them in remembrance though we may be very sure and firm in our belief of the truth it is not improper for the pastor and our christian teachers to frequently teach and remind us of the same truth in fact 
a minister of the gospel or a pastor in order to be useful and profitable to the church need not think it necessary always to present truths which we have never heard before he renders essential service to the church when he reminds the church of what they already know but they are prone to forget preachers must endeavor to impress the basic message of the gospel on the heart and the conscience of their hearers for these truths are imperishable essential indispensable important and timeless the mere fact that at the present were firm in the belief of the truth is no certain evidence is no guarantee that we shall always continue to be that's why we must put in remembrance always Peter saw that importance and he used the word remembrance, remembrance, remembrance over and over again. Even Jesus Christ, see what he said in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading to you from verse 26. John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring how many things? All things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. All things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. In Jude, verse 5. Jude, the first part of verse 5. Here it says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this. You knew it before, but I will put you in remembrance again. And that's why we need to understand it's important we keep on remembering and keep on remembering and keep on remembering second peter chapter one in second peter chapter one from verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though you know them and be established in the present truth yes i think it meet as long as i am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly i must put up this tabernacle even as our lord jesus christ has showed me moreover i will endeavor that ye may be able after my departure after my death after my disease to have these things always in remembrance i go to point number two the reaffirmation of an incomparable testimony reaffirmation of an incomparable testimony here he comes to verse 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty here by this uh, peter the apostle he goes back to the time when he saw the glory of christ the splendor of the lord and the majesty of the lord on the mount of transfiguration and then he says we're talking with assurance we're talking with conviction in our hearts because he says we have not followed cunningly devised fables but we were eyewitnesses of the majesty the power the glory and of the coming of the lord what did he mean by this the, the apostles were eyewitnesses of the glory and the majesty of christ so the message they preached was not invented by the artful cleverness of men. And there are people, they concocted a lot of things. And they write these books that have no scriptural basis at all. And all the things they are writing in the books, uh, because it's not scripturally based. They have to say that, you know, uh, from experience, from talking to the people that needed deliverance, or from the visions that they saw, from the dreams they saw, or from somebody that got converted from the secret cult, or from somebody who had been in the spirit world and now is converted. And this is what he told us. And from all the things we're hearing, then they begin to put all these things now, and there is no basis in the scriptures cunningly devised fables but peter said we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of christ and the coming of christ the reason he was saying this is that there were some already that were confusing the believers and he was saying that uh, the, the lord is not coming again 
there have always been doubters and there will always be doubters who walk by sight and see no signs they say we don't see any sign that jesus is coming again that's why he was telling the believers to remain steadfast and not to allow anyone anything to shift them away from their steadfastness look at uh, second peter chapter 3 verses uh, 3 and 4 knowing this first that they shall come in the last days coffers walking after their own lust and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation that's why he then jumps to verse 17 and he tells them in verse 17 ye therefore beloved seen ye know these things before beware be very careful lest ye also be led away led astray with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness he wants us to be steadfast in the truth that we already know now in verse 16 for second peter chapter 1 verse 16 he mentions two things about the lord the power of christ and the coming of christ and he refers back to the transfiguration but let me concentrate on the word eyewitnesses to start with that is the apostle was saying that he was an eyewitness and the apostles the other apostles too they were eyewitnesses he was not alone and therefore the testimony he had was a kind of incomparable testimony and he reaffirmed that testimony that he had in first john chapter one verses one two and three that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the watch of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was for the father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ what john is saying is that as peter was an eyewitness i too i was an eyewitness because it's what we have seen what we have heard what we have handled of the word of life that's what we're declaring unto you in luke chapter one luke chapter one even luke recognized that there were eyewitnesses that saw face to face the glory and the power and the coming of the lord luke chapter one verse one for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed so then you see that these eyewitnesses they had the power and the glory now they saw the power and the coming of the lord one the power two the coming look at romans chapter one the power of christ romans chapter one and there in verse four and declare to be the son of god with power declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead the resurrection from the dead and then in john chapter 17 john chapter 17 the power of christ the power of christ john chapter 17 there in verse 2 it says as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him so then you see what peter is talking about peter is saying that we saw we were eyewitnesses of his majesty not only his majesty his power and then his coming his coming and that's what jesus christ said to them directly in john chapter 14 john chapter 14 there in verse 3 john 14 verse 3 and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again he said i had it myself i was there when he said it 
we looked face to face and he pointed at us and he said i go to prepare a place for you and if i go i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there ye may be also not only that do you know that at the time when jesus christ was taken up into heaven we were there peter was there john was there james was there the disciples of the lord jesus christ they were there and lo and behold jesus christ was taken away from them and as they were looking up into heaven and they were gazing into heaven while jesus christ was going away then appeared two men in white apparel that is angels of god reminding them reassuring them again that this jesus is coming again look at it in acts chapter 1 acts chapter 1 verse 9 when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven you understand then that uh, there were eyewitnesses but they were not only eyewitnesses even the holy spirit the holy ghost was a witness concerning the lord jesus christ acts chapter 5 verse 32 acts 5 32 and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the holy ghost whom god has given them that obey him and you see then that he reaffirmed reaffirmed that incomparable testimony in second peter chapter one second peter chapter one verse 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables and that gives assurance to your heart rest in your soul and rest in your mind when you think about it what we are following about being born again about living a new life about if any man be in Christ is a new creature all things have passed away all things have become new about the necessity of righteousness except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God and seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things shall be added unto you when you think about what you believe the possibility of sanctification the possibility of holiness and righteousness and the necessity indispensability of that holiness because it says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord when you think about the power of god that with him he is able to do all things and he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty he will say he is my god is my faith when you understand that the protection of the lord is complete and you are complete in him in jesus christ whom dwells the fullness when you know that you have not followed a cunningly devised fable everything you believe everything you stand upon you can go back to the word and find it in the book and find it in the word of god it gives you assurance and then you are singing your way to heaven and you are not like these people that the winds are blowing here and there because they do not know what they believe that's why paul that's why peter said we we know what we stand on we know what we believe we have assurance in our hearts because we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you, some people when they preach, they don't have assurance, affirmation, a concrete conviction of the things they say, of the things they believe. But he said, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses. And when you have been an eyewitness of salvation, being born again, and it happened in your life, when you have been an eyewitness of healing by faith only in the Lord, and you are an eyewitness, when you have been an eyewitness of sanctification, the uprooting, eradication of that Adamic nature, and the Lord fills your heart with pure love, total love, and you have been an eyewitness, when you have been an eyewitness of the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and you are immersed in the Holy Ghost, and through and through, your soul and your mind and your spirit, and you knew this is power from on high, when you have been an eyewitness of all these things, nobody will be able to shake you out of it. But if you just come here, and you are not an eyewitness of that salvation, you are not an eyewitness of that sanctification you will easily be shaking in fact your life will reveal that you are not an eyewitness i come to point number three the recollection of the instructive transfiguration 
recollection of the instructive transfiguration it says in second peter chapter 1 verse 17 and verse 18 for he received from god the father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount let's find out what peter was talking about in matthew chapter 17 matthew chapter 17 reading from verse 1 matthew chapter 17 i'm reading to you from verse 1 here it tells us talking about the transfiguration under six days jesus takes peter james and john his brother and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light and behold there appeared unto them moses and elias elijah talking with him and then answered then answered peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the clouds, which said, This is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased hear ye him that's what peter was referring to he said we were there on the holy mount when the father spoke from heaven pointing to jesus christ and he said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and then he said in verse 6 and when the disciples heard it they fell on their face and were so afraid and jesus came and touched them and said arise and be not afraid and when they had lifted up their eyes they saw no man save Jesus only Jesus only Jesus only you see they saw Jesus they had seen his glory and then he said the father spoke and said this is my beloved son and that was the second time the lord was the father was going to speak from heaven because he had spoken earlier at the baptism of jesus christ when he was baptized in water by john the baptist repeating the same thing and well pleased in him I'm well pleased in him. I'm well pleased in him. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Verse 16, verse 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And look, the, heaven were, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. My challenge to you is can the lord speak to you like that when god examines your heart examines your motive examines your action examines your private life examines the books you read examines the pictures you look at examines the videos you watch when the lord examines your relationship and your talk when the lord examines your relationship if you're a woman with other men when the lord examines if you're a man your relationship with other women apart from your wife when the lord examines how you handle money god's money or even the money belonging to the family when the lord examines your attitude your disposition to your friends to the brothers to the church of the living god and to the people that call themselves your enemies when god looks at every part of your life can god say like he said about jesus christ when god looks at your action from morning till evening in the day and in the night when you are happy when you are not happy when everything is going your way and when things are not going your way can the lord look at you and say this is my beloved son this is my beloved daughter in whom i am well pleased and that's what we're looking for for the lord to be able to say that he's well pleased in us in everything we do and everywhere we go everything we think and every disposition every attitude we have and what we do in the house of god and what we do in our homes everywhere concerning the lord jesus christ the lord bore testimony the father bore testimony every time this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased it tells us in john chapter 5 and the witness that the lord jesus christ received in john chapter 5 verse 36 john chapter 5 verse 36 but i have greater witness than that of john for the works which the father 
has given me to finish the same works that I do. Bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. The Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Did you hear that? Jesus said, you know why I'm happy? And you know why I'm satisfied? And you know why I don't mind what the Pharisees think about me? What the Sadducees think about me? What the Herodians think about me? And what the Jewish people think about me? You know why I'm not worried? What the Samaritans think about me? The Father, who is the final judge, the Almighty and the Most High, the Father has already borne witness concerning me, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When well, you have that testimony in your heart, and the Father bears witness that he is well pleased with you and is well pleased with everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, and the manner of your life, your comportment, and your attitude. When you have the testimony of the Spirit of God within you, that the Lord is well pleased with you, you don't care what Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians and the Jewish people and the Samaritans, what they think about you. In John chapter 8, verse 18, John chapter 8 verse 18 here he tells us I am one that bear witness of myself and the father has sent me that sent me beareth witness of me in first John chapter 5 verse 9 first John chapter 5 verse 9 first John 5 9 if we receive the testimony of men, the witness of God is greater. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. And Peter recollects all that. And Peter said, we still remember, so fresh in our mind, when we were with him in the holy mount, how the father bore testimony concerning him, saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The recollection of that incomparable instructive transfiguration, the recollection of that just brings more assurance, more assurance in our hearts that we are following the right path. Tonight, the Lord has taught us concerning the necessity of recommitting ourselves to the timeless truth of the word of God. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is when you remain firm, unshakable on that truth, you will be kept free. Let's rise up and pray. The word of God is supposed to lead us to obedience. When you hear rise up, you rise up. The word of God is supposed to do something within us. And if all that you are hearing does not make you obey, I don't know whether there's any hope for you. Everybody, I said, rise up. The reaffirmation of the truth, recollection of the truth, the remembrance of the truth, these eternal truths of the word of God. Ye must be born again. Remember that. Sanctify them through thy truth. Remember that. The power of the Holy Ghost coming upon your life and transforming your weakness into strength and power. Remember that. Obedience to leadership, obedience to the instruction of the one the Lord has used to raise you up and to give you the ministry that you have. Remember that. Let's remember the word of God. The indestructible truth, the incomparable truth, the infallible truth of the word of God. Remember so that you'll be able to continue. You'll be able to continue. Even after you have left here, maybe transferred somewhere else, whether the pastor is around or is not around, you'll be able to remember the truth of the word of God. You'll stay on that truth. You abide in that truth. You'll be living by that truth. Remember, remember, remember.